Okay, well, I'm Sean. I'm Dr. Callahan. I'm Sean Callahan. Um, I'm originally from Virginia. Um, I've been working at the University of Utah since uh, this past August. I do kind of a mixture of things. I do about half of um, general pulmonary disease in clinic, and then the other half is interstitial lung disease. I have clinics in Farmington, which is about half an hour north of the city, a clinic in the, at the General Hospital, and then I do about a quarter of my time in the VA. And I do a mixture of ICU time as well. I have no financial disclosures to, to know. So today we'll be talking mainly about COPD. Um, I wanted to talk quite a bit about interstitial lung disease to realize that's probably not super practical here. So probably 80% of this is going to be tailored for some of the newer, newer advances in COPD. The rest of the time, we'll talk a little bit about changes that have been coming up in interstitial lung disease and what we can offer specialty wise at the University of Utah. So, first, um, just generally the big advances that we're going to talk about in the COPD realm. Um, there's been a lot of debate over what sort of inhalers patients should be on initially in the COPD. When I first started training, I think we just put everybody, no matter how bad their COPD was, on Simbicort. I feel like that's just what I was told to do in clinic. Everybody just got Simbicort. In the last few years, there's been a lot of newer trials. Um, most of these are going to be from the New England Journal of Advanced Respiratory, some pretty high impact pulmonary journals, um, saying that there's quite a bit of nuance in these inhalers. So I want this to be practical for you guys and we'll try to help through what the limitations are. For patients who do need Simbicort or other inhaled corticosteroids, how do we decide which patients should be on those? What do we do for patients who have pretty mild COPD, so ones that don't have too bad of PFTs, they're not really dyspneic, they're not frequently in the hospital or coming to your clinic? And then what do we do with oxygen therapy? Because believe it or not, there's actually some newer trials coming out to do with oxygen. So first off, basic background, I think you guys know this, but COPD is the third leading cause of death in the United States. The overall percent of the population that's reported to have COPD, so patients who self-report having COPD, is around 6%. That's probably not a super reliable number, but that's what it's believed to be. Nevada is right at the, the national average, the 6 to 7%. What's interesting though is about half the patients who have true to God obstructed PFTs don't know that they have abnormal PFTs or more, meaning that this number might actually be a, a, a low ball estimation of the number. Well, other than mortality, why do we care? Um, this is data from the CDC and shows that patients actually are really limited by this. Um, so they, they split it down based on whether patients are current smokers or former smokers. Do they do some physical activity or no physical activity? And they just try to get a sense of how um, limited they are on a daily basis. And it's pretty terrible. Um, over half report some level of activity limitation just because of their health problems. These are pretty minor things. So when they break down what are the limitations you're having, it's like gardening or playing with your kids. It's pretty bad. Um, difficulty walking up stairs using special um, equipment such as wheelchairs or walkers, and then unable to work is a pretty high percentage as well. So patients tend to be pretty disabled in this. How do we usually treat these patients? So historically, we told patients quit smoking. That's always going to be true. Like patients have to quit smoking. We'll prescribe oxygen, and we'll talk a little bit about what to do with that. Give them vaccinations, and then eventually we just throw a bunch of inhalers at them. And we talked a little bit that this is this is in flux over the last few years. As I was preparing this talk and going through a lot of the, the landmark trials that have come out in like the last five or so years, one consistent theme pops up, which is really trying to get a sense of what is the, the type of patient that's sitting in front of me. Can I try to think through a phenotype of this patient? What I mean by that is, is this a person who's frequently in the hospital? Is this someone that has horrible dyspnea that's out of proportion to their PFTs? Is this someone who is very stoic and has no symptoms but is obstructed over their PFTs? Don't just look at it blanketly as like, this is a person with COPD, go. I want you to step back and think, what is 
the what does this person's COPD really look like? So going through some of the bigger trials that start breaking down the type of phenotype of these patients, a lot of them are based around exacerbations and trying to prevent exacerbations. I was talking to you earlier that when I started fellowship, we just put everybody on Simbicort or some sort of pill or on steroid. And we've known for a while that that's problematic. So having patients on inhaled corticosteroids, while they do decrease inflammation, this is an inflammatory disease in the lungs. That medicine has side effects, right? So there's a higher risk of, of pneumonia with it. So it's not a medicine that doesn't have side effects. And then there's thrush and laryngitis and also that people have sometimes. So this trial, um, kind of awesomely named the blind trial, took patients with COPD and they had to be not just mild with COPD, they were having exacerbations at least once a year. So somebody who came to your office requesting steroids, antibiotics, where they're going to the emergency room being admitted to the hospital bed. And they split them down the middle, half got a long-acting beta agonist plus a steroid versus a long-acting buspirinic antagonist plus the lava as well. And then they were trying to be practical about it. They weren't looking at deaths, they weren't looking at um, others, huge, um, huge outcomes. They just wanted to see did it decrease the number of exacerbations patients were having? The lambus is what? Oh, sorry, long acting muscarinic um, antagonist, so like Sariba. Sariba would be a good example. Um, so they found that patients who were getting the long acting muscarinic antagonist plus the long acting beta agonist did quite a bit better. So there was 11% reduction, reduction in COPD exacerbations. And this was true for about all of the exacerbations. So the, the graph on the right looks at, they found statistical significance in both moderate and severe exacerbations. Moderate being they're coming into your office asking for steroids and antibiotics. Severe meaning they had to be hospitalized. So this kept patients out of the hospital and out of your, your clinic just by making this uh, this inhaler change. Importantly, they still found that there was a significantly higher rate of, of pneumonia in patients who were getting the steroid inhaler. So this has been seen in multiple trials now. Um, it is a it's a big risk for patients getting semicord, Flomet, and Qbar and stuff. So this combination of inhalers, the long-acting muscarinic antagonists and long-acting beta agonists. Um, the combination inhalers are fairly new. When I was going through residency and early part of my fellowship, I wasn't really taught about these because they're newer inhalers. Um, so I think it's worthwhile before we go through other trials, just be comfortable with what these inhalers are, what they look like, and what you counsel patients on. So in the United States, there's four. There's the Enoro, the Sialto, the Ujibron, I not sure if I pronounced that correctly, and then Vespi. And we'll just talk through what each one of them is. So each one has um, roughly the same type of medicine in it, but the delivery device is different. Um, so the Enoro here on the right is um, has an Olympta delivery system. That's just the thing that it's in. The large top right part, the patient flips, flips down they hear a click, that means the medicine's primed. They put the medicine in their mouth, they take a deep breath in. This is a good medicine, but one thing to be aware of, this is a dry powder inhalation that they take. If you have a patient who's really sick and really weak, um, it has bad COPD, they're not gonna be able to generate enough force and get this medicine into their lungs. So while this is a good medicine, if you have somebody who's like, stage COPD patient, this probably is the ideal test. Next is Stialto. Um, I personally like this one. Again, I don't get money from Stialto, but I like this one because it's um, like a cool mist. So it's a mist that um, gets in the chamber of this, and when the patients get in, um, when the patients put it in their mouth and they suck it in, it distributes forcefully to their lungs. People have done some pretty fancy um, radiography that show that it distributes better than um, the 
your nose inhalers, inhalers with the um, uh, with spacers. So basically, the patient takes the cap off, they twist the bottom of it, the medicine um, gets in the chamber, and they take a breath then. This is a little bit better for patients who are pretty weak and have a little more. The Uterbron, um, it's similar to a Noro. It's a dry, uh, a dry powder inhaler. It's a little bit like Spiriva, so they put a capsule in, they close it, the capsule gets punctured, and they take a breath then. Again, if you have somebody who's pretty weak and pretty bad COPD, this is not like the best inhaler for them. And then the Vespi is a meter dose inhaler, like your albuterol, your ventolin, and Reventil. Um, the, you know, the downsides of the, these medicines are often they hit the back of the throat. It requires good patient compliance with it. Um, so I'm, I'm a runner. I have exercise-induced asthma. When I am in trouble and I have to use my PRN albuterol, I don't do a great job. I'm the board certified oncologist. So like, I really try to keep patients away from this if you can. If it's what insurance will pay for, go for it. But I personally don't like this because it requires very good compliance, a good patient, a smart patient to get something. Do you recommend a spacer or that one? I would, yeah. There's one, uh, I don't know, say, pull, yep. uh, pull in the study. I mean, they, they, they compare these two groups, but in practice, that's not what we do. Yeah. You're going to have them on Spiriva as well. In the first group with the steroid and the level, you're, they're going to be on Spiriva uh, anyway. So, therefore, in practice, you're going to see uh, if you add a steroid to this, now compare the, the two groups because they're already going to be on Spiriva. Yeah, so that's, that's assuming that the patient's already been on Spiriva, right? Well, so. well that's one of the first ones. So, right. so they will be. So, so the question is now, now which is better? Right. So we'll we'll get to some of this, and then there are some trials looking at, um, you know, just starting patients on a triple dose inhaler. Now, um, I don't bring up that trial, but um, there is a large literature trial I think it was last year that looked at just starting ICS, lava, lava all together, and seeing if that's better than doing this sort of stepwise. Right. And so for more severe patients, it makes sense just to start with all three. Um, this is assuming that you're getting a patient de novo with COPD for the first time. They're starting to have exacerbations. So it's a great question. Um, this is more for starting out. So you, you, you like this to go to start out? Um, if, if, if this is a person who has a pretty bad FEV1 when you start out um, and it's a too savvy, yeah. Um, honestly, I'm going to go with whatever insurance can, can give me. Um, I'm not paying um, but if I have my choice of options, I'll go with that. Um, I do want to point out this source. It's from National Jewish, definitely a competitor. This is a great website. Um, they, this, this lady, um, this in all the pictures, actually walks through how to use each one of the drug delivery devices um, thoroughly. So she spends like five minutes on each inhaler. I don't expect you guys to know how to use each one one of them, but know that this resource exists. So um, you can direct patients to this, and it just walks through how to use the phone. What would you Google to find this? Um, just Google National Jewish um, and the other teaching. Just National Jewish um, and the other teaching. All right. Moment of brevity at lunch. Uh, we'll have to forego the clip then. Um, I would encourage everybody to look up um, Dr. House asthma inhalers. <laughs> you can see some good clips of um, patients working using their inhalers to see patients like that all the time. So should we give up on inhaled corticosteroids? Um, so logically, it would make sense that these patients who have eosinophilic disease, because we know there's a certain population of patients with COPD that are going to have um, an eosinophilic phenotype, meaning if you draw blood from their arms, they're going to have a higher eosinophil count than they should. If you collect sputum from them, they're going to have eosinophil sputum, which they shouldn't have. What percentage that is, we don't fully really know. But logically, those patients should do better with an inhaled steroid, right? Because steroids are disasters for these nipples. 
Um, this is not a large randomized control trial. It is a large retrospective population study um, done in Europe that looked at patients who got um, lava, ICS, like Syndicord, um, Advair, things like that, versus long acting muscarinic antagonists like Supreme. And they wanted to see does it improve exacerbation rates? So for patients who have higher acyclical levels, they have less numbers of CPD exacerbations. And then the, the graph on the right shows kind of this steep inflection point around 4%. So if you draw somebody's blood at around the time um, you're going to start them on medicine, if they have a neosynthyl count that's greater than 4%, or a count that's greater than 300, it suggests to you they're going to be a, a good patient to respond to the health of steroid. Um, this makes sense. So when you have this amount of eosinophils in the blood, so 4%, 4 that correlates with starting to get eosinophils in your skin. So that, that makes a lot of sense um, logically that this patient should do well with the steroid. <coughs> it's important to note, though, also in this study, they still saw higher rates of pneumonia um, in steroids. So in the back of your mind, be mindful, you're putting this patient a little bit at risk. Um, I personally always tell patients, like, I'm probably going to increase your chances of getting pneumonia, but I might also keep you out of the hospital, so this is a bit of a weighting risk. Um, we're not going to go through this one, but just so you know, this idea of eosinophilic COPD is kind of hot right now, and you may see agents like this used more in the future. So, nephilizumab, I don't know how much you've seen, but this is an anti with 5 is a mediator for eosinophils. We typically see that in asthma. Um, but this was a large trial looking at giving methylizumab for patients with COPD. And for patients who had high eosinophil levels found that it reduced COPD exacerbations too. So going forward, we may start seeing more of this. So you might see patients on these crazy long um, antibody meds. So what do we do if patients have COPD that's really mild? Um, you know, this happens all the time. I get a patient referred to me in clinic. They have PFTs that are not too bad. It's a guy who smoked forever, who's continuing to do whatever his, his hard daily job is, and he has really no complaints. So, do you tell them just to quit smoking? Do you, they, do you just do albuterol as needed? Do you do nothing? Which a lot of people would advocate you should. And then in Salt Lake City, this is often what I get. Do I take sense of oils or some other sort of nature and natural thing? So this trial was done in China, and they took patients who had like mild dyspnea, mild obstruction, um, and no no exacerbations recently, uh, recently. And they randomized them to receive either placebo or basically spareva. So they, their primary outcome was looking, what does their PFT decline look like? And they were like, aha, this shows statistical significance. Patients' PFTs actually um, went down much slower if they got daily spareva. And they considered this a big success. I will point out it was only 20 cc's per year. So that's not clinically meaningful. So you wonder, like, why the heck would we do that? The reason why I still push it for patients who have uh, obstruction on PFTs and are not clinically um, problematic is because it really does reduce the number of exacerbations. So even though they feel well, if you get to 24 months at the end of this graph, there's about a uh, 15 to 20 percent reduction in COPD exacerbations. So. If they can afford it, if insurance will pay for it, I still try to push patients on it because I really don't want to send people to the hospital. It's you know, it's terrible to get a phone call uh, from your clinic that hey, so and so had to go to the hospital for three weeks today. So there's a So they'll, they'll actually do some of the nebulizer. So, so which ones will they cover? I'm not familiar with this. Yeah. Okay. 
So it's it's a once a day one, or is it like a once a day? Once a day, same for So what are the See, they won't, they won't cover the puffers, only do only the machines okay. uh, on those fancy drugs. So, so you can't get spree, but like you, whatever's in the machine, they don't. Yeah, I have the same problem. So the we book, we get it through Lincare, and Lincare gets it through the government. Whatever the journal says, to recommend, I can't give it for the yeah. If you can get it nebulized, I would remember it. Um, yeah. Lincare has a list. Yeah. Yeah, because I have to order like natural and inhaled like nebulizers, algebra nebulizers. It is not uncommon that I have to do like QID um, like competent, you know, uh, it's, it's not. People can not put competent. Yeah, for, I mean, nebulizer is okay. It's not ideal, but it is okay. Um, I think that, so there is some data looking at um, regular use of short acting, muscarinic antagonists, um, showing that it still probably is beneficial for um, PMT decline. So I would still try to push it. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, the thing is that it's very frustrating when you try to practice. Yeah. Because I can't follow the guidelines. The patient said, I can't, you know, yeah. I can't pay the $400 for the So do you end up doing the nebulizer for the most part? Will they even do it if you prescribe it? I just give the answer to that. Okay. Okay. Or inhaler. I mean, the nebulizer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, whatever is the cheapest, because it doesn't, like, all this stuff came out a while back, and I can't practice whatever the recommendation, because they just can't. So will they take it, like, as needed, or will they take it scheduled, or what will they do? So I'll be or they'll, they can buy it, like, actual as plus or minus. You won't have to know, a combo of no. Because it just won't be paid for. It's it just too expensive. expensive. Gotcha. So all these things, I mean, it's nice, <clears throat> yeah. but in practicality in this town, I, gotcha. I just if, give whatever they chose to take. If you can get a muscarinic antagonist into their lungs and they will take it, I would go for it. If, if it can be covered, they can afford it, I would go for it. Um, and it's it's solely for this, right? Like, you know, I know that their PFT decline improves, but it's really probably a questionable statistical, uh, clinical significance. But, you know, the hospitalization is going to be way more than that medicine is. And I know that they're going to take their risk, you know, they're going to take their chances with it. Yeah, but here it's uh, people all smoke if you're high up. It doesn't so matter. Like, the hospital is full of smoking. You can so yeah. Yeah, are those medications that Lincare offers, are those compounded medications? Like, there's like, there's no, just I can't go look at that. Right, right. they're liquid forms. Yeah. Yeah. They're through an outside pharmacy company, so we care and sell it to a couple of people since they're using it. Like Reliance, one of the things is a work with. Um, so it's through a Reliance pharmacy, and I don't know what else is there. I know they come, sometimes they will come in a combination where they get both um, albuterol and vitrocon <laughs> together. Which I just, that, that steroid was being disinfected. Oh, so they'll cover budesonide, but they won't cover flow and the pubic cord, sure. but they'll cover budesonide. So so I have someone who's got Medicare. Uh, they, I can't get them Spiriva, but I can get them, you know. And it, it, it's funny because there's two Sparivas. There's the... Um, yeah, so that's the handler, yeah, and, and some, sometimes one of them will <coughs> that month be really cheap, uh, and sometimes they're all expensive. Um, there's this uh, there's, there's this new brand of lifted by this and that real lifted and increased lifted uh, whatever and sometimes they're cheaper sometimes they're not and you know so this is it is it is called call the farmers hey one of these cheaper and I say I don't think they're cheaper. It also depends on insurance. Yeah. Compliance is really high. Yeah. And we we don't have the time to keep it straight down to you. It's the same, it's the same for me, right? So like I, I have tons of patients who come to see me without insurance and I go yeah. with whatever my so a lot of times it ends up being QID. Yeah, but I was I'm here to talk about what is probably like ideal for these patients. Um, we know from a population standpoint, it's probably cheaper to do this for people than have them be admitted to the hospital. But I understand somebody who's looking to get a paycheck, this is not right. But if they can take it, then why not? Um, I don't know what your guys' practice has been. There's some data that says that patients who 
take these these muscarinic antagonists. They have some sort of um, uh, they, they feel better when they take it. That's never been my clinical experience. So I kind of have a spiel that I tell every patient. Something like this, feel free to take it or leave it, but this is what I usually tell patients. Listen, this inhaler is not gonna help you feel better after you use it. We know your lungs are gonna get worse. This medicine may reduce how quickly they decline. There's a good chance it will keep you or people like you out of the hospital because you're breathing. And I feel like that leading with this rather than giving people inhalers and saying, take this, and when they don't see an effect, this tends to work a little bit better for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about oxygen for COPD. Um, you know, it's been driven into my brain since I was a medical student that people who are hypoxic with COPD, they need oxygen. And there are some trials, actually kind of small trials from the 70s to show that patients who are hypoxic with COPD have a mortality benefit. The question is, has arisen, what do we do for patients who are borderline? So patients who have SATs that are like just above hypoxia, so 89% to 93% or something, what do we do for those patients? What do we do for patients who are fine at rest, but DSAT when they walk? So you may have heard about this trial, it came out two years ago, it's called the LOT trial. Um, they basically took patients with those two parameters, patients who were satting okay at rest, and then when they exerted themselves, they desat it between 80 and 90. Or they took patients who were satting between 89 and 93 percent at rest, and they gave them oxygen. It was a multi-center trial. I think Utah was one of the sites. Their primary incomes I didn't think were too logical. They looked at death, and they looked at hospitalizations, and they found there was absolutely no difference. So you, the questions I had when this came out were, were those appropriate things to study? So these people were COPD, but they weren't super sick at baseline. So does it make sense that giving these people oxygen would cause changes in death and hospitalizations? They also found no improvement in quality of life, um, depression or anxiety, how far they could walk on a six minute walk, um, or functional ability. So their conclusions were for patients who are borderline, you don't need to aggressively give them oxygen. Um, a lot of criticisms to this um, have revolved around the fact that patients who are borderline, um, their primary care doctors or pulmonologists did refer them to the study because they felt so strongly that, hey, this person is really benefiting from oxygen. So I tend to see patients who are like around 91, 92%. If they're not super symptomatic, I try not to push oxygen on them, but if they're really symptomatic, um, I kind of ignore the study and still push oxygen. That's largely what I think. Um, summing up the COVD part of this lecture, before I get into it, I would encourage everybody to look at the, the goal guidelines. You know, they, they publish these pretty frequently. There was a new set of guidelines last year. Um, they're very good. I find the goal guidelines a little bit hard sometimes for me to find exactly what I want. And I find the stratification of gold A, B, C, D to be hard sometimes. So basics, I, we all know this, but it gets raw tree, pre and post bronchodilator. Get a sense of exacerbation frequency. I think this this idea of eosinophilic um, COPD and giving these patients steroids is a good one. And so get a CBC with differential to help you figure out who to give ICS to. If they're really hypoxic, prescribe oxygen. We're very sure of that. It's people who are in the middle that we don't help. And then for the inhalers, kind of a practical way of thinking through this. So, like you were mentioning early on, we give people spareva, we give them spareva antagonists. But these are patients who have pretty good PFTs, they're minimally dysphagic, they have no exacerbations. Once they start coming in for exacerbations, these are the ones that you need to go up on therapy. So, most patients. Probably be more appropriate for a llama or a lava. Again, work with your insurance company if you can. Um, and then severe, these are patients that we see over and over and over again. Those are patients that really should see a pulmonologist and are on the triple therapy, like I mentioned. So patients who are on a steroid, a llama, and a lava. Um, any questions about COPD before we move on to the last 10 minutes? 
mean, some people at this elevation, but it's required a little more support than you would. Yeah. So, what have you done? I sometimes they also use a bar to sell it, but it just requires a little extra stuff. Um, and if you do that online, particularly on Facebook, anyway. This is that you're referring to the in health story yeah, yeah. rather than, yeah, okay. I think that's fair. Um, I would, I'm, I'm sure that you're doing this, but just, um, not, not everyone, but some of the only thing you have to do is like, let's try this one. Yeah, if it if it works for patients and keeps them out of the hospital, um, I think that's a reasonable a reasonable plan. I, I don't hate ICS. Like I still give inhaled steroids a lot. I do a lot of general pulmonary. Um, I think back of a lot of patients I've had in my clinic go in with like true true blue pneumonias and end up in the ICU. And so over the course of my short career, I've Really try to re rethink my practice of putting a lot of people on in health care steroids. I'm still learning as somebody from back out east what to do with oxygen um, because we're at such a higher elevation up here. So I just want to comment. Tell them to move. I'm sorry? Tell them to move. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, so let's. Let's move on to interstitial lung disease briefly. Um, so this is what I see uh, half the time. Um, brief reminder, there's over 200 separate diseases of this. Uh, the true prevalence is really unknown. The percentage really depends on the subbase you look at. The best places that I've actually looked at epidemiology have been France, so they found 0.1% in New Mexico, which is about 2%. It really depends on who you are and where you look. The numbers on the right are from France. What's interesting is in, in recent years with the advent of lung cancer screening with CT scans, we're finding quite a bit of incidentally found interstitial lung disease. So it's like five, six, seven percent on um, CT scans done for other reasons. Distribution varies widely by geography. So in France, it's largely connected tissue diseases and sarcoid and pneumoconiosis. I would imagine out here it's a lot of pneumoconiosis. And then um, it's very highly variable based on occupations. Um, the historic context of this is most patients, like, almost all patients got it wrong. Most patients got a surgical lung biopsy. Um, the important thing to know about surgical lung biopsies is while they're very, very good and we live in a study, um, a certain percentage of patients have uh, maybe exacerbation when you take a chunk of lung out. And that's thought to be somewhere in like the 2 to 3% of patients, especially patients who have pretty limited function to begin with. Mortality has always been very high, and we can offer very little, and then we aggressively gave people lots of immunosuppression. This is a study from 2012, I think, called the PANTHER trial, um, where we were giving people with IPF, radiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, based on biofilm prednisone, and found that we were killing people by doing that. So as like a big group, the interstitial lung disease stock stepped back and said, hey, what are we really doing? We shouldn't be immunosuppressing so many people. Um, there are some new things in IPF that I just want to call your awareness to. Um, last year, there was a, a new set of diagnostic guidelines by one of our large pulmonary governing bodies, the American Thoracic Society. Um, and it, they talked through imaging, um, how to think through the imaging findings that we didn't have, thinking through when to biopsy patients, um, when to have a multidisciplinary committee, et cetera. They really propose a, a background, or sorry, a backbone of workup for IPF and other interstitial lung diseases. Um, the backbone that they really harp on is something called a high resolution CT. So this is one without contrast. So we don't get IV contrast for it. Um, doing that kind of makes it hard to visualize the visual parts of the lung on the periphery. The really narrow cuts, so they're very thin cuts, so we can see through very high um, uh, definition. And then they do prone imaging, so they put them on their belly. So I see probably a patient a week in clinic who's referred to me for interstitial lung disease, who's just morbidly obese, and then they have um, particular changes in the basis of the lungs, so they put them on their belly, which is that one pieces. Um, thorough occupational history, which we all do. And then 
one thing that isn't available at all centers um, is the multidisciplinary discussion. So pulmonologists sitting down with radiologists and pathologists looking at the biopsy at the same time. Um, some new things to be aware of. So I talked about before, almost everybody got a lung biopsy of some sort. Um, the, the radiology guidelines for diagnosing UIP, UIP is a pattern that we see on CT scan. It correlates very well with the pattern under the microscope of people's lung biopsies. Um, we've known if people have certain findings on the CT scan, it's almost 100% probability that if we take out a chunk of their lung, it's going to look like UIP. So for a certain number of patients for a while now, we've known those patients don't need lung biopsies. In the last couple of years, we found that patients who are um, who have findings that are maybe a little bit less strict still are extremely likely to have UIP. So as a result, we don't have to send as many patients for biopsy anymore. So we can try to just figure this out with blood work and looking at CT scans and getting a good occupational history. One of the things that comes up a lot when I talk with primary care providers is they're very scared that their patients are going to go through a surgical lung biopsy because, you know, 2-3% have a really bad outcome from it. Um, so really trying to scale back everybody that we're sending for biopsy. Um, these are some kind of cool new things that are, that are coming out for ILD. Um, this thing, cryobiopsy, so if you, can, I don't know if you can see super well in here, um, but here's a tip of the, the bronchoscope and then there's this probe that's jutting out. Basically at the end of the probe is this, um, is a, is a part that freezes. So around the, the, the probe is a penumbra of frozen tissue. So they go out to where they want to get a biopsy spot, they freeze it, and then they pull the whole thing out. And as opposed to going out with little biopsy forceps that you go out and get pieces of, they can get a piece that's about five times bigger. So they're actually getting really good yields, meaning that the rate of appropriate diagnosis is about as high as the piece for the, uh, the surgery. The problem with this, as you can probably imagine, is um, there's lots of bleeding <laughs> with this. There's high rates of pneumothorax with this. I bring this up because this is something that's um, still in research stages, but some people in the community are doing this. A lot of international groups are saying, like, please don't do this in the community. So if someone is doing this, I would not try to do this. Um, because this is something that should be done somewhere where there's like IR backup. It can cause a lot of bleeding. They can go and embolize something. Or somebody can get a chest tube in quickly. Um, just please do not do this unless you're doing it as part of a research um, treatments really quickly. You may hear about these as primary care providers. There's two new therapies for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis called um, Intimidev and Pepemidev. Um, they're FDA approved only for IPF at this point. You may see patients with other interstitial lung diseases on this, rather on it for research purposes, or somehow their doc got it, got it somehow approved. Um, the important things to know with these is these are not cures. So patients go on these thinking everything's going to get better. Um, they All they do is slow the rate of pulmonary decline. So your FBC is the main outcome that these studies have looked at. So they show that the FBC rate of decline goes down. It goes down less fast than it did before. It may also improve um, how far you can walk at six minutes. It may decrease the number of exacerbations, but they're just not the panaceas. There's a questionable mortality benefit that some people are arguing. Um, this is really up for debate. So, you know, my practice has been to aggressively put people on these because it's about the only thing that we can offer a lot of patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But mortality benefit is very debatable at this point. Some takeaways, outside of IPF, the therapy is largely unchanged. Um, if you have somebody who has the interstitial findings, I think it's really beneficial to get them to Utah or somewhere like Utah, just because we have these big groups of people that can sit down and come together for an adequate uh, consensus diagnosis. Um, we have just more resources, so we can do lots of research trials, and then like I have a pharmacist who can help troubleshoot a lot of these medications with patients because they can 
Um, if you do send someone to us for ILD, here are some things I recommend getting beforehand. So just do like a basic autoimmune workup. So like ANA, RF, CCP. If you can do a non-contrast CG of your chest, that would be helpful. Um, these patients can get pretty hypoxic, so appropriate oxygen for them is, is a plus. And then our echocardiograms to see if they have organ failure. Um, please don't give them steroids if you can. Um, if you can get the patient to quit smoking, it's just really hard for me to tell um, if the patient has burnout, um, uh, DIP or RBILD, which is smoking related or just one disease from like IPF or um, hypersensitive pneumonitis, things like that. Um, if patients have obvious exposures before you're sending them to me, um, please try to get them off of it. So obvious things being like deodorant, if they have freestanding mold in the house, like in the fire or hot tub, or if they have like parakeets, cockatiels in the house, or down comforters, things like that. Um, in general, things, big pulmonary things to look out for this year that you'll probably see in the headlines. There's some pretty clear trials coming out with the Boston Death Race and the for COPD. So uh, the one that we have out now is the Rifflimilas, the pill. Uh, um, they're coming out with inhibitors that are inhalers, so you may see that in this year. Nitric oxide is very in vogue now and being used for a lot of different therapies to help with this could be positive or not. But you may see um, trials come out for PAA, COPD, ILD. Well, there's always new antibiotics coming out for ILD. Um, we should see some results of those this year. And then on the ICU side, um, there's going to be some um, um, trials looking at cloning and paralysis uh, this year as well. How, how are they doing the nitric oxide other than the idle vent? Um, it's a good question. The so, vent, I should say. So, so is this, are they able to get it? So they're, they're coming out with these like portable devices that can deliver it and continuously through basically the end of the annual. Um, I've not seen those, but that's my understanding. So they're not worried about other effects, possibly. I mean, because I mean, nitric was basically for um, uh, to, to reduce the uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, but I mean, you you get a re you get a pretty bad rebound effect of that if you if you try to off. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to debate the merits or downsides of <laughs> using. <laughs> I share your concern. Okay. Um, there, there are a lot of issues theoretically with using nitric oxide for rebound is particularly concerning. Also, if you have patients who are on nitric oxide, potentially you could base dilate areas that are right. not, you know, very well ventilated, and that yes. could lead to a decrease in your oxygen level. We'll right. see what they come, come out with. Um, I would say I personally am not a huge fan of this, but I'll see what this is. Um, so these are things you may see pop up this year. Um, we have a lot of trials ongoing at Utah. We'll go through each one of these, but we have um, some stuff in IPF, some rheumatoid um, arthritis associated with ILD, some sarcoidosis. Um, and then we participate in a lot of data, data registries. Um, so we do genetic banking of patients with ILD just to try to get a sense of what sort of genetic markers are present in patients with ILD. Um, we thank stuff for the, the PFF registry and then resat as a sort of basis registry. So if patients come and we don't offer them anything, at least we can try to get some data from them to try to help the public knowledge. 